What's up, pumpkin heads? This week, the plants are going outside. We get a visit from a funny grower. The University of Wisconsin takes a look at my soil test. We run our soil test results through a fancy calculator, and we see how the plants acclimate for the week. Stay tuned for live action. You're watching Moby Mike Pumpkins on YouTube. Hey, Jim, thanks for coming out. Did you bring that product with you? Oh, yeah, got it right here. I gotta have this. Uh, what, what is that? I don't know. You know, you gotta win a certain way off in Altoona to get this, but uh, I didn't even know it was in here. Uh, <laughs> boy, why'd you bring this in? <laughs> so, yeah, here's your product, buddy. Uh, all right, hey, thanks, Jim. Okay. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm coming for that belt this year. <laughs> get it. Come and get it, little Mikey. Here we got the 2200 Wolf, 17 days old. She's finally going in the ground. So we got her little hole prep there and we'll get her in there. All right, 2261 Schmidt, also April 28th, 17 days old, going in. That plant's a ripper, man. And finally, we got the 2593 Peyton. I was waiting for soil temp to get above 68 degrees. These two are running 70, and then the one that had the cables in a little longer was running 73. So they should all be good where they don't get shock so we'll get them in the day and now we gotta start taking care of these little guys all right here's the setup on the 2261 on this one i have a digital thermometer on my other ones i just use one of these house ones but this one i got a soil and an air temperature and if you'll see there it flashes between the two the soil's at 73 the air is at 72 um so there's just a probe there and one up there and that's actually for a barbecue uh one's a meat probe and the other one's your grill temperature but it works good for pumpkins there is a receiver for this and if you're lucky enough where your patch is close enough to your house you could watch the temperatures in your house unfortunately mine's far enough away where it, it won't connect to that receiver and then i got a heater here just to kind of take the edge off at night it's a 750 watt there is like a thermostat on there it doesn't say what it is but i run it on a christmas light timer just to run it overnight not in the morning I don't want to spike these too hot because I don't get home from work until 10 a.m. So I want to make sure that the plants aren't cooking in here. All right, here's a time lapse for the week. You can see I'm digging in the soil cables here. One house up, two house up, three house up. And we're getting them vented there. I think I got the plants in by now. You can see in the close hoop, I'll be watering. There I am watering. And then we have a visit from Rick Jolivet. There he is. And then shade cloth on there. That's it for the week. Plants have been outside for two days. Let's take a peek at them here. Here's a 2261 Schmidt. That thing looks beautiful. Nice and dark green, really settled in nice. While we're taking a look at that, I wanna answer a question that's probably gonna come up is, why don't I double plant the hoop houses? Couple reasons. A lot of people say, well, you should double plant because you know if you kill one, then you'll have another one. Well. If you do something to kill one of them, you're gonna kill both of them. If you forget to vent the hoop house, if you over fertilize, you're gonna screw both of them up. The only case that maybe you won't kill both of them is if you had a strong wind come through and break one off. That's one reason. Another reason is if you plant two of them in here, they're gonna take up you know, quite a bit of room and you'll have to make a decision, remove one, and then you gotta recenter the house because I want to get the maximum amount of time in this house before doing that. It's more work to recenter the house. And then back to the decision, yes, you have to make a decision. So some people will double plant with the same seed and they will look exactly the same because they're of the same genetics and cut one out. Or one might be a little bit better than the other. At this stage, you cannot look at a pumpkin and tell which one's going to grow a bigger pumpkin. Or they'll double plant with two different seeds, and one might be a little slower, one might not be. Once again, you don't know which one's going to grow a better thing, so it eliminates a decision that really doesn't need to be made. It eliminates moving the hoop house around, and really doesn't save you from killing your plants and making mistakes. So I just find it totally unnecessary, but you can do what you want. Another pro tip, make sure you take your pot out of your hoop when you plant it, because what can happen is you get that pot in there, and you got these venting for the day and the wind comes up, that pot will roll across there, smoke your plant and break it off. All right, let's take a look at this soil test report here. Uh, I submitted this and I 
I told them I want to do like 60 tons per acre of pumpkins. Uh, they said that was outside the ex expected range. So they put me down to 15 to 20 tons, like 58.8 tons per acre would be a world record. So, you know, I'm not really digging their negativity here. So with their recommendations, they recommended 80 pounds per acre of nitrogen, which I can agree with. They say my phosphorus and potassium is excessive. Uh, I don't agree with that. Calcium, they say, is about 1,400, but I have multiple tests showing that I average about 3,000. So I'm going to do the right thing and just go ahead and make up my own result on that. They also didn't test for copper and iron, so I will make those numbers up too. So we'll throw this in the soil calculator and see what we need for the patch. All right, I'm going to go through the soil calculator real quick. I'm going to link a video in the description below to Cecil Weston. He's going to go over how to use this thing for an hour. I can't possibly show you it as good as him. Everything I learned was from him anyway, and the guy that made this sheet, Brian Langley, and I'll also link where you can get the sheet at. So just quickly, I input my numbers with stuff I made up like calcium. Anyway, what I'm really looking for here is I want, I, I like to run my base saturation around 7%. I did 50 parts per million nitrogen, which is 100 pounds per acre, which is a little more than like the university said, um, which is fine. Anywhere 40 to 50 is usually pretty good. I've done up to like 75. It, Seems to be a little bit much on the nitrogen. Plus, I like to add some during the year. So keep that kind of low. Down here is kind of what I'm adding. This is like a chicken manure with uh, kelp and stuff. This is 0050 um, gypsum. This micro pack here, um, be careful with a micronutrient blend. Like this stuff, they recommend one bag for like five acres. I'm putting a bag on like a tenth of that or even, le even less than that. Um, and like my boron here is close to five, which most people, most soil scientists would say that's getting in toxic range. Usually they recommend one part per million per 1,000 parts per million calcium up to 4,000. So up to four ppm is like the max that you should do. Um, I'm going to do five because I know what my soil is and how it uh how it leaches nutrients. So that's gonna be fine for me. It might not be fine for you, especially if you got a clay soil. Be careful when you're dosing micronutrients at a high level. Then we got some alfalfa meal. That's just some um, organic material. It contains a growth hormone called tricontinol. Helps your plants uh, grow a little better in like the vining stage. Doesn't really help much for fruit growth, but yeah, a little bit of that tricontinol. Um, feather meal, that's my main nitrogen source there. And then a little bit of kelp meal. There's all sorts of good good stuff in kelp meal. So anyway, that's a brief description. Check out that video from Cecil to really learn how to use this. All right, it's May 3rd. Let's take a peek at these. It rained a little bit last night. It's an overcast day. I probably won't even vent these today. I just opened them up so we could just take a look at them after they've been in the ground here for a few days. Here's a 2261 Schmidt. Looking good. Uh, let's go take a look at the wolf. This weekend it was 80 degrees both days. It was really windy and I had these hoops vented and I kept the sides down, you know, about like that just to keep the wind from whipping the plants so bad. But I was having a hard time keeping the heat under control. I was, I was running about 100 in each one and they were stressing a little bit. We ended up on Sunday. Uh, Rick Jolivet came up to get some uh, plants from me. Uh, he helped me. We put some shade cloth on these things to kind of cool them down just to keep the sun from getting in there. As you can see, we're, we're fairly close to 80, 80 degrees today. It's like 60 out and there's no sun. So imagine it was just full sun and it was 80 out. It was, it was hard to keep them under control. So here's a 2200 wolf, uh, probably the biggest plant so far. Uh, it's looking good. And then last but not least, we got the Peyton 2593. This is a smaller plant, but it's done really, really well. I think it's gained some ground. This plant did the best with the heat. Uh, maybe it was because it was smaller, but it did a good job with the heat. And uh, so something I'll do is we'll pick a star of the week, which is an idea I got from the Peytons. They always pick a plant that did the best for the week and being fitting, we'll choose their plant for the star of the week this week. So it's doing good. Still, still behind the other ones, but I have no doubts that it'll catch right up. All right, that's it for the week. Make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Good luck and grow a big one.